Welcome to this week of a and in Depth. I am so glad to be here with you today. We are going to talk about what makes a good leader, what makes a great Christian leader, and what are some of the fundamental characteristics of what a Christian leader is. And today I have with me, as always, my friend Sam Neves and our guest, uh, the president of Advent Source, Brad Thor Forbes. Brad Forbes. Thank you so much for being with us, Brad. I am so happy to have you here. It's good um, to be here. <laughs> I, as you know, we've talked a little bit about leadership um, in the past several weeks or months since we started this program because it is one of the biggest um, parts of the I Will Go initiative. But this, but this is a different type of conversation because we are going to be talking about what are the characteristics of a good leader, especially within Christianity, and. Um, why is that so important in in a church? And I, I guess I see it being important in all levels of church and in our institutions and in the world. Um, so I'm gonna just throw it out there. Um, the first question, let's just throw it out. We'll start with Brad. What What is a Christian leader? Like what makes, what is what to you is the defining characteristic of a good Christian leader? Um, well, I, I think that uh, foundationally, uh, people have to have trust um, in, in the leader. And when I say trust, um, I would mean that they need to trust that they are going to do, uh, the leader is going to do the best, that they have the best in mind for the other individuals, for the followers uh, of them. They've got to know that it isn't just about the leader, it's about the whole team. Um, mm. Yeah, actually, Sam, you and I were just talking about that yesterday or Monday. Yeah, yeah. It, it's it's amazing how Brad nailed it, in my opinion, right on the spot. Because if if as soon as you say Christian leader, obviously you are you are connecting it with Christ, and that's the point about Christ. Christ was always trying to teach, trying to help, trying to form, trying to inspire his disciples to be. And often the vision that Christ had about his disciples was much better than they had about themselves. He saw them as as sort of you 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 are a bundle of potential. That's all you are because right now you, you're really not there yet. But I believe in the, your potential because a lot of times leaders will act, and the question will come: Are they doing this for the sake of themselves, or are they doing this to advance the cause, or are they doing this to help me? And when you are in an environment where the leader there is zero doubt in your mind that the leader is doing everything so that you can progress in your life, in your your career, in your in a local church setting, in your ministry, and so on. Well, then then we surrender to that leadership. It's inevitable. Uh, however, when we when there is that little doubt, are they doing this for themselves or are they doing this? Then forget it. There's nothing else you can do. Well, actually, as yeah. soon, I would yeah. say, Sam, as soon as that shows up, just a little bit of that, it's almost like a mustard seed of, of disaster as far as a leader goes. You've got to, you've got to really build back. Uh, so I think make, for yeah. leaders to know uh, that is so important that they're, that they're transparent and that their uh, people trust that they have their best interests at heart or the and the best interest of the organization because really we don't we aren't just in a vacuum leaders and followers we're leading in organizations and have followers who are there to help uh for part of the greater good greater goal yeah yeah it's interesting i when i was researching this topic i was researching christian leadership and one of the quotes that i read and this is from bill bright who is part of campus crusades for christ um he said great men lead people but greater men train leaders. And it sounds almost to some extent what you're saying, like finding the good in people and leading them to their best qualities. Is that somewhat true? Yeah, I've, I've been preparing a series of sermons I'm preaching in for Hope Channel on the book, Desire of Ages. We're gonna cover the entire book, you know, Desire of Ages, every story of Jesus. And it struck me, I mean, time and again, that Jesus never wrote anything. Jesus never recorded yeah. a single podcast. Jesus never had any official position given to him by any other human organization. Uh, he he was an outlier in most cases because he was playing. He wasn't playing the five year game. He was playing the millennial game. You know, he was playing. He was wanting to impact the world. 
And when you want to impact the world, you need to focus on others. Do other people understand what you really are trying to do? And that's what Jesus did. He lived to help his disciples understand um, the message that God had given him to, to proclaim. If, you know, a, a lot of thinking has been done on, well, okay, Jesus came to die. Fair enough. But he lived too. And he spent his ministry focusing on, on building this movement that would absolutely change the world in every way possible. It changed how we measure time. And, and he did it through his disciples because they finally understood what it was about. So if leadership, if you want to impact the world in the next couple of years, then you focus on yourself. If you want to impact the world in the next 200 years, then you have to focus on other people understanding what it is that you're about. Well, and I would say if you want to impact in a broader way. So the interesting mm. thing about, about Jesus to, uh, to me a, a, as a model is, you know, we, we sometimes say, well, he focused in on the 12. But it's even more than that, I think. It's, it's that he focused in on them individually. So he didn't treat them all the same. Mm. Uh, uh, and, and a lot of times we'll just say, well, leaders just need to empower other people. Well, some people need to be empowered, but some need to be coached um, and some need to be supported and, and some need direction. Um, and so I think as, as a leader, one of the things that we're challenged to do is to know our the people that we're uh, leading well enough uh, so it isn't just a scatter, uh, you know, you put it out there and say, uh, okay, yeah, one size fits all. It really, you know, we need to know our, our at least our key uh, core group that we're leading well enough to personally uh, get them. The other interesting thing about Jesus is, so he, when he went to heaven and you looked at those uh those disciples, I mean, you just say right there, it's a failure. They had no idea what they were doing, right? But that wasn't true. He had invested, invested. And sometimes I think when we step away, we say, well, you know, they don't know. But but if you've invested in, in them personally and given them the vision of what could be, then uh, they're going to reach back into that. You know, it's interesting because yeah. I, in, in preparing for this, I was reading this book um, and I wish I would have gotten more further into it, but it's Lead 12 Gospel Principles for Leadership in the Church by Paul David Tripp, who is an author and a pastor. And he talks, he was actually talking that one of the principles he has was about limits. And um, so setting limits and li and that um, one of the things that was interesting to me was um, one of his, his principles that we have limited gifts. God gives us each gifts, but they're limited, right? So we have a limited amount of gifts from God. And so this is something he said, and it sort of reminded me of um, what we're talking about, said no leader is designed to know or do everything. No leader is meant to work alone. It is dangerous for any leader to be dominant, so dominant that the gifts of others don't get expression, leaving that leader to do things he wasn't gifted by God to do. So if we are not as leaders encouraging the people around us or by pouring leadership and encouraging them, then we, to some extent, don't benefit from the gifts that God has given them to to round out our ministry as well, because we are not gifted by God to do or know everything. There are, and and I would hope that we would be humble enough in our leadership to um, recognize that, and then to put people around us maybe that have gifts where we lack. I, I'd be interested to hear what you say about that. Think well, about that. Every pastor has that temptation because the pressure <laughs> is on the pastor to be everything to everyone. And the thing about leadership is that you will be criticized if you do, and you will be criticized if you don't. Mm -hmm. If you want to avoid <laughs> criticism, then avoid being seen, avoid being a leader at all costs, because it's impossible to do anything in leadership without attracting some criticism. Uh, except when you leave. After you leave, you're such a hero. Everything is wonderful <laughs> after you leave. But once yeah. you're gone, once whilst you're still there, you will hear it. Um, so we have. I have an example about this. In in my previous church, I was the youth pastor, or I was I was supposed to be the associate pastor, and the church kind of positioned me as the youth pastor. But it wasn't supposed to be. So it was like okay, youth pastor, which essentially means what you need to do 
is to create an environment for the youth. You need to lead the youth service. You need to do all these things for the youth. And I thought, okay, that's I can do that. That's that's great. Okay. And then I realized that my senior pastor actually realized that the very reason why my very presence was curtailing the development of leadership gifts among the membership to lead mm -hmm. the youth. There were no youth. There was a pastor to do it, a very capable pastor who's very articulate. And he can do this and this and this and this and this. And because of my presence in the youth environment, then that was having a negative effect in the leadership. So he asked me, he said, Sam, this is going to be painful, but what do you think about stepping back? Yeah. Uh, I said, okay, what's the plan? He said, well, if we, if the parents are annoyed enough within a year that there is nobody taking care of their youth, then they'll step up. It's a risky plan. Right, because you're going to purposely frustrate and disappoint people uh, that you're supposed to care for, so that they step up. Well, that's exactly what happened. He was absolutely right. Within the year, we had parents decided, "I can't, I can't watch this anymore. I need to do something about it." And then they started doing things. And then their children, who are no longer teens, they're now young adults, twenty-something-year-olds, stepped up to the plate to lead. And suddenly, without a pastor, lots of gifts were developed. And isn't that the temptation that the pastor does everything for everyone, but it stops the membership from developing their gifts? Well, but and, and it's it's not even the temp it, only the temptation, although that certainly is the temptation of the pastor to to do everything. Um, but it also puts the pastor in sometimes positions where they may not be gifted. I mean, one of the expectations of pastors is that they chair the church board. Uh, what? Well, I know a lot of pastors who are really great pastors, but really awful chairs. Um, but they have, but there's people in in their uh, in their congregations who could do that, and and the and the pastor certainly fully engaged, uh, fully part of, but but would it have to get into the nuts and bolts of what it takes to chair a, a church board, which can be kind of tricky sometimes. Yeah. Absolutely right. Yeah. And, 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 I've, and I've talked to pastors about this and they said, you know, I just am not, I, I can't give that to someone else. I, you know, the expectation is that it's me. And, and, you know, when it comes down to it, I, I need to be the person that's chairing. I, and I, I think for some pastors, it's, it's limited uh, right. what, they, what they can do uh, there because of that. In every, in every list that I saw, um, or read in every article that I read, in every book that I've read, humility is mm. one of the big assets of a Christian leader. Um, that a, that somebody who is willing to say that they made a mistake, that they don't know everything, and maybe they're not the best at that. Do you guys agree with that? Do you think humility in a leader is something that's important? So I think there would be a lot of pastors watching this and maybe other leaders. And within the context of the Seventh-day Adventist church, typically if you do your job really well as a local pastor in your 20s, you're invited in your 30s to lead a local conference ministry or even administratively. So whatever you do well in your 20s, you're then taken from the local church and you're invited to, to lead at, at more churches, you know? Because when you talk about the evangelical world, you have mega churches in the evangelical world. Adventists don't have mega churches. We have a conference. So the conference, the, the senior pastor of a mega church in the evangelical world is the equivalent to the local conference president. That's really important for us to understand. Otherwise, you get some Adventist pastors who are doing everything that the other churches are doing and not finding the results. You're not going to find the results because the model is very different. So the local church, the local conference president is the is the equivalent of a senior pastor in other denominations. Nonetheless, in your 20s, if you do it well, you will lead a ministry in the, in the conference. So if you're good at Pathfinders, for example, and your club is amazing in your 20s, and every church you arrive in your 20s, within three months, there is a club that emerges. You can count on it. Around your 30s, if you're still there in that conference, you'll be asked to lead the, the ministry at a conference level. And then if you do a good job in your 30s there, and just around your 40s, you're invited to the union which is a collection of conferences. And then you, you do your good job there. Then eventually you're invited to lead maybe your division. And then eventually, uh, for some, the general conference. And so there is a idea of progression in your career. And this to me is a, it can be both a blessing because you 
when it works well, you're looking for more responsibility. How can I influence a larger number of people with my leadership? I think that's healthy. On the other hand, you create this idea of career and people, especially pastors that sign up to be pastors, you signed up for the local church. That's a pastor, you know, and, and that's your calling. So I am now serving the general conference as a associate communication director. I hope that one day God calls me back to the ministry that he called me once to lead a local church and that day will be a very happy day. Um, but in, in terms of being called to do, to have a larger influence or a leadership beyond a, a local church, there are two things that the Adventist church prioritizes. And I've seen this to be true everywhere. Uh, the first thing is competence. You have to be good at what you do. Oh, but I know this person who was called because he was a friend to the president and so on. It's actually very difficult for somebody to put your name forward for anything if they don't think you're competent because their reputation is on the line. And if you are incompetent, as soon as they say that you should do that job, if you don't do a good job, that's the last time they recommended somebody because nobody else will listen to them. So first thing is that you need to be competent. It's very important that you can do the actual job. Um, the second thing that I found is humility, which is what you're saying, Jennifer. And humility is, is a, I define it as, within this context, I define as, will they use their newfound influence to further their own uh, things, or will they use it uh, to help others? Again, back to what Brad was talking about right at the beginning. Will they use it? Will they use their, because as soon as you have more influence, people will have more deference towards you. We respect our leaders in the Adventist church. We do that all over. It doesn't matter if it's Scandinavia, where people say, well, everybody's the same. I have seen, I've been to Scandinavia. My ministry is all in, in the UK. Um, I, I'm now in America. We, we speak with deference with our leaders, and that's important. But how are you going to deal with that? Brad. And, and no, absolutely. To uh, to your point there, I mean, I can remember growing up uh, as a missionary kid, and uh, so you know, Dad was working in the union, but I can remember clearly when the people from the general conference would come to our union, you know, and and how and how important that was. I can also remember, e even just as a kid, how amazing it was uh, to see these these men. Because, uh, sorry, Jennifer, at that point, they were all no, men. No, it's okay. I understand. <laughs> uh, um, uh, how, how humble they were in not saying, well, I'm the general conference person, in saying, you know, so we're here to support you in ministry and, you know, being right up there. I mean, I can remember the youth uh, the youth director coming in. He's right there, you know, we're pitching camp. And, you know, he wasn't off somewhere else. He was right there greeting and, and being part of things. So I think the humility of, of being, putting yourself in to whatever the task is, and then giving credit instead of saying, well, you know, I, my department did this or my conference did this to say, you know, really what happens like in a local conference, the pastors of this conference have just come together and are accomplishing great things for God, you know, for the conference president to say, to say that the pastors will say, Oh, well, you know, they knew that and the members knew that, but for to have the someone who has the humility to be able to, to give um, credit uh, and, and even to give credit uh, where credit may not be completely, you know, they the people will look at a leader and say, well, but you had something to do with that. Well, yeah, probably, um, but but not to, not just pat it to say, well, yeah, you know, this was my great idea. If it wasn't for me, this yeah. would never <laughs> happen. Exactly, exactly. And that, and that, if it wasn't for me, is is a recipe for disaster as far as far as leaders go. You you will you will turn around at some point, and it will only be you, uh, yeah. because you're because the people that you are leading will be headed a different direction. And if there's nobody yeah. following, you're not a leader. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but it's it, it's interesting, and I'll, I'll say this really quick. I people say, you know, like how do you get into positions? Uh, leadership within the Adventist Church, and I said that I will say sometimes the quickest way to do to not be a leader in the Adventist Church is to try to be a leader in the Adventist Church. Oh, if you if because, you want the one thing that would disqualify you immediately is that if you really want it, 
I, I've seen yeah. this before. If you're perceived to really want a position, forget it. It's never yours. It will never be yours until you can genuinely say, I, I'm i happy where I am. That That's a really interesting dynamic. Well, and, yeah, and, I, would, and I would say that that is particularly true if you talk about working your way through the organization. When you yeah. come down to the local congregational, uh, that, that may not be quite uh, the same, um, but but still, people who push themselves on ministries and say, I walk walk into nominating committee and say, I'm the person that needs to lead VBS because I know how VBS needs to be uh, run. You know, for me, the nominating committee will go, Ooh, okay, let's let's check this out. Yeah, yeah, exactly right. Although, although in some local churches, they'd probably be like, thank God, because yeah, nobody well, else wants to read It, 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 is, it yeah. is the truth. Yes, that yeah. is the truth. Um, the other thing that I saw, and both of you, when we talked about humility, you touched on this. The other thing that I always saw as a trait of a Christian leader is the ability to serve. So it wasn't to be a leader through serving. Um, I think that Christ led through servant service. And um, so this has been in everything I read, humility and willingness to serve are the two two things that I feel like were consistent. Um, there were a few things, but these two were the, probably the most consistent of everything I read um, as leadership. Are we willing to serve others? And do you guys agree with that? It, it, let me just give some nuance to that because I don't think it's that clear cut in i think it's absolutely true but people will interpret that in different ways so a new generation yeah. will interpret that let's just take pastors for example or in a local church leadership because we're talking about christian leadership uh let's I, i'm talking about less business and more you know church yeah. context so within a church context um when a new generation of pastors hears that they need to be servant leaders and they need to be and they need to serve and they need you know all of that is very true and they're like okay I, i'm that's what i'm gonna do and that in my experience i i'm very happy that i've had a mentor at the time his name is is pastor patty boyle he married us he's um audrey anderson's uh father and i remember once after a service i was doing the chairs and uh, you know i was doing cleaning up the place so that lunch we could have lunch and he comes to me you know and he's he's irish it's he's very direct so he goes what are you doing i said i'm just helping with the chairs and so on that's not your job do you see those they're deacons that's their job that's not your job your job is to pray and your job is to preach and you have a very to visit that's your job don't take their job and i push back i said but i'm a i'm a, I'm a servant I'm, i want to be seen to be doing the right thing. And I said, there are people that want to talk to you. Pay attention. Who else are they going to talk to? You're the pastor. Just go and sit somewhere quietly by yourself and just watch as people will come and talk to you. Pray with them. That's your job. Do you remember the disciples? It's not It's not right for us to stop the reading of scripture or in, and the praying for us to set tables. Follow the example of the disciples. They were, they, they were following the Holy Spirit. Don't fall into the trap of doing everything as a pastor. Everybody has a job, do yours, and they'll do theirs. So there is a, a very, this is very controversial almost, because it's like, okay, you're too good to, to clean tables. Are you a pastor? That's not what he's saying. Right. What he's saying is, if you decide to do this, you will not be able to do that. And you've already said yes to that. You need to say no to this because you've already said yes to that. And I think that this balancing out for local leaders is extremely important. Otherwise, the pastor will always end up trying to do everything. And therefore, the members will always be children who never grow up to take responsibility for things themselves. I don't know, Brad, what are your thoughts? Um, so I agree that uh, saying service, uh, being a servant, uh, what that tends us to lead us to is to be a doer. So you, got, you mm. can be really wrapped up in activity. I'm, I'm, being, I'm doing this service and I'm doing that. Like you said, I'm picking up the chairs. Um, I think that the challenge uh, for us uh, is to say, so er, people have their roles. So the deacon has their role. But if, if we're in where we need something done and, and the pastor or the elder or the deacon or whoever it is says, oh, no. 
that's that's not that I don't I don't it's do that. Beneath me. You know, it's beneath me. me to do yeah. that. Um, then I think that that you know, to me, servant leadership means uh, that certainly I'm I'm going to be operating in my in my gifts. Uh, in my gift area, uh, but it's really going to depend on the situation. I don't do the same thing. So, so some uh, Sabbaths when we're getting ready for potluck, I may need to pitch in there, and some I may be sitting over in the corner. I think as a leader, one of uh, the things I need to do is to look and see. You know, are the deacons struggling? Do I need to get some other people? Do I? Um, you know, what's my role there? Sometimes my role. If we're in crisis, is to is to jump right in. Yeah, absolutely. The other nuance that I think comes with this, especially for this the pastors that have graduated over the last ten years, say, is that we've seen a phenomenon that you go to them and you say, "Would you serve as a personal ministries leader at a local conference?" And they either say no or they feel guilty for wanting it or saying yes. So you know how we were saying before, you know, if if you are you will be disqualified if you if people perceive that you really want that job. Right. The opposite of that is also negative. Really wanting the job and believing that God has called you for it gives you a sense of entitlement for a particular job. God called me to be president of this conference. I just wish other people would realize it. <laughs> well, that that isn't divine at all. Jesus does not have that spirit. On the other hand, if you have an uh, uh, if you have the sense that God called you to be an administrator, for example, there are some pastors that are called to be administrators. We need great administrators. I think we all have mm -hmm. experiences of terrible administrators, and and so there is such thing as a good and a bad administrator. We can decide that. So competence. Mm -hmm. If you feel that God called you for a particular ministry or a particular area, then don't tell anyone about it. You don't need to. Maybe you're wrong. Just buy the books and start reading become better at it yeah it, it's interesting because you said that and, and i've actually heard pastors say to me um you know i feel guilty for saying this but i really feel like the lord has blessed me with a great gift of like communication or being on camera or telling stories and there is that sense of i like am i being if am i not being humble when i say that i feel like this is my gift and I feel like I'm not using it as well as I should, maybe in the context I'm in. Um, that is a really interesting balance for leaders to have where um, on one hand, we, we definitely want humble leaders who don't think too much of themselves. But on the other hand, to say, look, the, this is the gift that God has given me and I'm pretty good at it. So I'm going to use it the way he's asked me to. And I'm going to invest in it. You just described my early 20s. Yeah. You know, here I am, a pastor. I'm very good behind and in front of the camera compared to my peers, which generally tells you that God is calling you in a certain direction when you can do things that other people around you look to you for doing those things. Right. And I thought, this is it. I Communication is the area that I'm going to invest my ministry in. I'm going to read more about this. I'm going to become better and better at this. Within one year of joining the ministry, um, the conference nominating committee um, was bouncing my name for the communication director job. This is in a South England conference. And something incredible happened. The the president of the union at the time, his name, Pastor Don McFarlane, he came to me afterwards and, and he said, well, they, they were talking about your name and I vetoed it. And I'm like, why would you do that? You know, it's my dream job. And he goes, you need the local church. Mm. You in particular, Sam, you need to learn how it is uh, to be a pastor of a local church. And maybe, you know, in 5, 10, 15 years, God will call you again for communication. Uh, but for now, go to the local church, do your best as a pastor. And he was absolutely right. I, I needed the local church so that I would understand the Adventist church altogether. And my father yeah. was not a pastor. If my father had been a pastor, maybe there would be no need for this. My father was a coronel in the, in the military. So very different skill set to a pastor. So, <laughs> so that that to me saved me, uh, Jennifer. But I, for, I struggled with this for a long time. It's like God yes. is calling me for this, but He's not calling me for this. But at the same time, I think like the leadership ability that 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 union president had to say, first of all, owning up, I'm the one that vetoed you. That's right. It takes it takes I, a leader I, to do that. Yeah. I yeah. vote. I voted to leader to. I voted to lead, and he didn't. 
mess around with you. He told you exactly why you need to learn humility. These are the lessons that I feel like you need to have. Yes, you have this talent, but you also have this proclivity. So I'm going to take responsibility for what I did, but I'm going to tell you why I did it. And to me, I think that shows leadership. Absolutely. Because leadership is also taking responsibility for the decisions that we make yeah. and communicating them with clarity. And here's the interesting thing. He doesn't have veto power. <laughs> <laughs> According to policy, he doesn't have veto power, but that's a leader. And, yeah. and why was he doing it? He knew that I could help the conference in the immediate but he wasn't thinking of himself or the conference. He was thinking of my ministry and my future. Remember we are talking about before? Because he was looking at, at what is best for me and my ministry, mm -hmm. I respected the decision. I, I I think this is the first time I'm talking about it after, I don't know, 15 years. And and I, I have tremendous respect for him. Incidentally, he is now close to us here at um, Sligo Church. He's an administrative pastor at Sligo. So, but so, he also so, wasn't just thinking of your ministry, Sam. He was also talking about the benefit of the church. Sure. Because who yeah. knows how you would have acted in the state? Yeah. You know. Sorry. Well, I know. Ahead. It would have broken me and the church. Well, uh, so so this this leads me to to something else that I think is important for for leaders, and that is, you know, I don't know what your relationship was with the union president, but leaders, especially young people that want to to be leaders that want to develop leaders leadership skills need to find mentors yes, and those yeah. of us that are in the church that that have made some of the mistakes you know they say well we have wisdom well you get wisdom for making mistakes i mean you know that's just the reality uh, of things so um so you know i i uh Adventist is on a, a college campus we hire a lot of um the college students and people ask me, so how is it? I said, it's great. You know, they've got lots of energy. We can get things done. They're a little low on the wisdom end, but, but, that, but that's okay, you know, but because that's where the, the people that are here are full time that are leading in these areas, they're going to help them to make the uh, de good decisions yeah. and to do the right thing. And I think if you're a young leader, and I was blessed, Sam sounds like you were, uh, you know, to have people who are willing to commit to being mentors, either formally or informally, uh, and and you know, in this case, stepping in and saying, you know, that's that's not right for you. I mean, I had what uh, one that said uh, to me, you know, you turned that down, but you really need to reconsider. Um, you know, to take take that back to prayer. And I think that's a really uh, important part of leadership. I, I agree with you 100%. I, I am so blessed. I, I know in my, my time at the general conference, as I sort of moved up from, I started as a floater in presidential working on Let's Talk, um, like a hundred years ago. <laughs> I think, I don't know, <laughs> feels like it. <laughs> but I mean, to have women who are in leadership pour wisdom and prayer into my life. Yes. Um, I don't think that I could have, could be where I am now without having that, um, that leadership demonstrated to me because, um, you know, as young, as young people, we we think we know everything and we are, we're kind of rash, you know, I think this is a general sort of, um, characteristic of very young people you get out of school you have all the answers and you are going to give them to all the people. Optimism, and, optimism is high. <laughs> well, I have never been blessed with optimism, but. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're, you're pessimistically going to do it well? <laughs> well, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a realist, uh, which is the, the motto of the pessimist, I think. <laughs> um, but, but I mean, if, if I look, you know, I started working for Bettina Kraus, who is now the Associate Director of Public Affairs and Religious Liberty. Yes. Um, she was my first supervisor. Um, I, she has given me immeasurable wisdom on how to work in a professional setting. You know, Elaine Oliver, Heather Don Small, Raquel Heist. So I've been very blessed. But, and I, I think that it's something that we don't talk enough about in the church or um, at any level is in the importance of mentors. And I wish that was something that we were more structured about, like that there was a more structured sort of mentorship program that we could i guess there's internships but that we we would be more um sort of purposeful about because i think that it is such a contribute it contributes to success and leadership 
Brad, let well, me run something by you. No, go ahead. You you say no, for I, then I, I, no, I was just I was just going to say. Um, so in, in in North America, this is this is coming up to be a crisis in in potentially crisis in leadership, uh, because at our year end meetings here a few weeks ago, they flashed up the numbers, and you know, and I won't call them exactly, but in the next five years. 50 to 70% of presidents and secretaries of the conferences here in North America are going to be retirement age plus. I mean, that's a huge, potentially a huge shift, even if, if only half of those. Uh, so wh where do we go? So you start looking down and you say, uh, or looking around and say, okay, who's gonna, who, who are we mentoring? Who are we grooming? Uh, because uh, really, um, being a conference president to go from being a pastor to being a conference president is not impossible, but it's it's a huge leap. Yeah. Um, and so, what are yeah. we doing to mentor? And and I think some people are, uh, but but I think systematically we're we're not doing that like we could be. Right. But I would also say really quick, if you are somebody who's watching this and you are just coming out of school or you are in your final years of college. If you're in your first several years of professional life, find a mentor and be humble enough to listen to them because it will make a difference in the success as you age. And it, even if you decide, look, my ministry isn't in the official church, find a mentor, like just do it. Find someone who is, and be humble enough to listen, I think is the best advice I could give someone who is about to leave college or starting their professional career, I think. Well, that was precisely what I was going to ask Brad about, because I, I have the sense that the fault here is not with the mentors. Mm. I have a sense that the younger people need to do more to find themselves mentors. So here's what I wanted to ask you, Brad. If, if you ha what would happen if a 20 something year old would come to you and say, hey, Brad, I've been observing your ministry, your leadership. And I wonder if you wouldn't mind mentoring me at some point. I have three questions right now, and I wonder if you'll give me, I don't know, half an hour of your time to go through it and help me make some decisions and see what I can do. Would you say no to that? Oh, absolutely not. I mean, I, I'd be honored to do it. And I, and I know that uh, because actually I've been, I've been matched up with people who are looking at uh, college, uh, either juniors or seniors, who have said, I'm looking for someone who uh, has business management skills um, that could be my mentor here for a semester. Mm -hmm. um, and and um, yes, I, I, I do it, but, but you're right. Uh, it, it, it's as a person here, I can't go and say, I'm going to mentor you. It doesn't uh, work that know, way. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't. It doesn't work that way. But but I need to be open too. I mean, I need to be willing to say yes because if you're a, a young person or even not so young a person, I mean, I I uh, needed a mentor when I was in my 30s and transition and and talked to mm -hmm. our our local head elder here and said, you know, can we just get together? Um, and you know, for him to be able to say. Uh, yes, instead of say, well, you know, I'm really busy, um, or you know, what is it that you really want? So, but I do think that the the person, the mentee, the person that wants to be mentored, is going to have to be, in most cases, uh, the person that reaches out. In my experience, yeah. I haven't met anyone, and I've I, I meet a lot of people. I've never met anyone that I thought, yeah, they would say no to that, but, because yeah. it is. I mean, you live your whole ministry. And if you're in ministry, I mean, if you are in leadership, it's because you you really want others to thrive. Otherwise, you're stuck in, in management. And there is a difference between managers and leaders. And if if you love leadership, despite all of the negative that comes with it, is because you want others to thrive. And so if someone comes to you, older or younger, it doesn't matter, yep. with, that, with that speech that, um, look, there is something you can, I believe there is something you can help me with. And I wonder if you could give me just half an hour of your time and then honor that half an hour or less. Mm -hmm. Don't mm -hmm. stay on for three hours because that would be the last half an hour you get. <laughs> so, you know, it honor that half an hour. I want to be true to the time I asked. If you have some time next week, I would love to 
pick it up and I will do some thinking about it. And then you go back and so on. And I, I want to point at this out. Oxford and Cambridge are tremendous universities and they have very little classes in the British system that you, you can have 12 hours a week of classes for your bachelor's, even less for your master's. And by the time you get to your doctorate, there are no classes. And you just have time with a professor that will, you, you spend a whole week writing an essay and then you come back to them and they proceed to absolutely destroy you <laughs> in what you've written. And then you go back and next week they destroy you, but a little bit less. And by the time you are destroyed, you know, for three, four years, you are a world leader because you had a mentor that would bring you some deeper thoughts and push you further than you could with a half an hour a week. That's all it takes. Mm -hmm. So if, but you need initiative, you need to have guts and a backbone to go to a leader that seems so far and distant and say, hey, there's something you can help me with. I wonder if you could give me half an hour of your time. And you don't have to say, I would love to be your mentee. I would love you to be my mentor. Those words are not necessary. Um, they right. don't need, they, sometimes it's even negative. But then, and then be very clear. If you need to write it, write it down uh, with exactly what you want to ask and what you want to say. They'll ask you questions. And again, I don't know anybody that would not say yes to that. And yeah. it, it can only okay. help. No, I, I, I agree. And I would say if you're if you take on the role of a mentor, you are taking on the role where you have got to be clear. This isn't a, uh, a, a listening session where you uh, listen to them and say, oh, no, you're doing all the right things. I mean, when you were talking about Oxford and Cambridge, you know that what comes out of that is the is the drilling down, asking the questions, making sure uh, that, you know, uh, that the decisions that are being made are what's, you know, are, are really, um, you know, Christ based um, and, and what the person wants to do in order to achieve their goals. Yeah. But also I think um, for the mentor um, being, making yourself available and open and also being someone who a person would trust to give advice. Like, I mean, no, none of us would accept advice. You know, I think there are some people who maybe want to become member mentors or something, you know, I think there's funny sketches, um, but that's a, okay. I'm going to be your mentor. And, and it's somebody you don't want. <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> just, I don't want you to be my mentor. So, so living a life of integrity, making sure your your advice is trusted, because I know that I would not trust, you know, I wouldn't go to the women in my life. And, you know, I was so grateful trying to navigate leaders, you know, being a leader and as a woman to have uh, the people who have gone before me putting, you know, that the things that they've probably had to learn the hard way back into my life. So I didn't have to learn the hard way. Um, and watching how they navigated leadership was so beneficial to me. But if I didn't trust their integrity, if I didn't trust who they were as a person, then it didn't matter what they said to me because I was watching their behavior and I was watching the way they acted. So yeah. being, a being a mentor is as much about your integrity as a person in the way that you act as much as it is putting words of wisdom into a young person as well. So a couple of a couple of things on that. The first is I think the results of the pandemic is that when we bring new leaders, they wouldn't have the time if we're still in lockdown to rub shoulders with us mm. and for us to and the new leaders, that is, to rub shoulders and learn by observing. You just mentioned it. I observe them. And I've seen you do it. Mm. It's 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 amazing. You know, you observe and then you try and do it. And that's the point of of being mentored and mentoring others. I've also seen other people that copy you, Jennifer because they observe you and that's wonderful. That's how it's supposed to be. I think that if we continue in lockdown, it's very difficult to observe somebody on Zoom. Yeah, it you is. You know, it, it's, so that's that's one thing. So on the one hand, yes, we can be more efficient working from home. On the other hand, I think that we've got this cast that has been, that has been set and now that we are working, it's like, how can I put this in, in a analogy? Imagine that you've got water that is frozen so whilst you remove the cast, the water is frozen. It's still holding the things that it's supposed to hold. But as new leadership comes, as this melts, there will be no longer this 
the supporting structure to mentor mm -hmm. new leaders. So that's that's one problem. The other thing is your leader. So we talked about you leading others. Now let's switch. We are all led by somebody. We all have a boss. <laughs> <laughs> we all have a local church pastor. Uh, or, or yeah, so there will be people that don't know how to mentor you or that you don't want them to mentor you who will still come and tell you things that you're doing wrong. <laughs> and and whether they want to help you or not, let me suggest that the best thing you can do is not to argue back. The mm. best thing you can do is to pay very close attention at what they're saying and just say thank you. You don't have to agree. You don't have to disagree. You just have to look and you have to say thank you. And and if you want to, if you're really extroverted and you want to add some more words to that, that's okay. You can say, you didn't need to tell me this, but you did. And I want to thank you for telling me because it's not easy to have these conversations. And you told me that would absolutely, if they want to come and criticize you, it will break them. If they want, and, and you will be attracting more, more helpful criticism, which is by definition, helpful um, because criticism can be helpful whether it hurts you or not. Sometimes we say constructive criticism. And what we mean by that is criticism that doesn't hurt us in the end is positive and it's wonderful and it's constructive. Criticism that hurts us is not constructive. Listen, every criticism is hurtful. That's why it's criticism. You know, when, when your mom who loves you the most comes and tells you things that you're doing wrong or your spouse for that matter, um, just say thank you. They're trying to help you. You know, don't fight with the messenger. They observe something that if you change and if you fix your ministry in your life would be better. Just say thank you and, and, and process it. If you don't agree with it, that's fine. Don't fight with them either. There are some people that keep fighting. I used to do that a lot, actually. People will come to me and say, and I remember there was this, this leader called Miroslav Puig. He was the communication director of the Trans-European Division. He will always ask me yeah. to help him in different projects. And I remember one day he asked me to do something in a pastoral meeting that he was organizing. And my alarm was, it, it, somehow it didn't work. And I did not get up in time to be there for the meeting. So he found someone else to be there. And he laid it into me. He said, this is unacceptable, Sam. You need to be responsible. You need to, and, and my response to him was, what am I going to do? The alarm didn't work. How... I was nine, I don't know, 21, I think. What should be what should have been the reaction? The reaction should have been, you're absolutely right, Miroslav. I apologize for this, it won't happen again. Oh. No. And, 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 and you said and you said this earlier. And if it isn't absolutely right, then you just need to say no. So thank right. you for thank you for for sharing that. Um, rather than pointing out all the things be, yeah. uh, because that's not gonna make a difference, it's just gonna make you upset and them probably upset <laughs> right well and also you you also said something you know in your response that you should have said that i think is also a mark of a good leader is taking responsibility for what happened yeah. whether we did it or not but also when we did do it you know um when we were first starting to do a m video um and we got something called the tricaster which is we call the trickster because it breaks constantly and it does the craziest thing and we would record um, a, somebody and then take it over to the computer to upload it and be gone, right? Now, it would be easy for us to say, well, the editor deleted it or the video recorder never pushed record or whatever. But as a leader whose job it is, you know, I made a mistake that it's not there. Um, I'm really sorry. Can we record you again? And sometimes that was a very unpleasant conversation to have with busy church leaders to say, look, I'm really sorry. Um, something has happened. I take responsibility. But that's part of leading too, yeah. is to say, to acknowledge when something has gone wrong and say, you know what, that's on me. I'm very sorry. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's an important taking responsibility yeah. is an important part of of leadership, um, and a, again, it, it's a it's a trust a trust builder where that you take it and you and you say, you know, I I have every your best interests in mind, and you know, to, we're just going to lay it out there. It was my responsibility, or I'm going to take responsibility. Jennifer, even though it may not have been you that did anything, you may have done everything right. But 
you know, when it came down to it, you taking responsibility. I mean, that's what leaders do. Well, it's, it is partially like, it doesn't matter. Like if it's me in a studio, if it's Sam in a PR room or like with um, our branding, if it's Williams, who's the communication director and our team, if one of us makes a mistake at the end of the day, the buck stops somewhere and it stops with the leader. And so he has empowered, you know, we have been empowered. We are told to do our job and we can, but we are human and we mess up sometimes. And where does the buck stop? Now, I hope that I have enough integrity that if I make a mistake that I'm able to stand up and say, look, I made that mistake. I'm really sorry. It's on me. But time and time again, and Sam, you know this, that Williams will go and say, look, the buck stops with me. I did it. Absolutely. You know? I've, I've seen it and it's very inspiring. I, I once did a presentation for administration and I was so far off the mark. It was scary. And he he put the umbrella up and all the bullets that were coming. He just took them all to himself. I, I received no bullet for what happened. Right. Mm. And it, well, what's frustrating, I think, sometimes for us is we want to go and say like, no, wait, wait, wait. That was on me. Like, that's yeah. on me. I did it. Like, I have. I, you know, I have no problem saying if I've made a mistake, it's just like, it's the way I was raised. You take responsibility for your actions. Yes. My dad was also um, an officer. <laughs> so, oh, you, you take, you take responsibility for your, your actions. And he was an officer candidate school. And so, you know, you take responsibility and that's, that's, you know, I have many other faults, but when somebody else is taking responsibility for your mistake, that's, that's right. But then, first of all, you it, learn from it, but then you also like appreciate it. <laughs> but it's one thing to take responsibility for your own mistakes. It's another thing to take yes. responsibility for other people's mistakes. Right. And, and I, I think that's what we're saying about Williams. You yes. know, you know, a sign of a leader, true leaders, they will take it for their people, the people that are that are behind them, who are their followers. Right. Well, right. then you have like five people arguing over who's going to take that responsibility, <laughs> like, pushing what, each other out of the way. <laughs> it's very, it, and you learn the lesson. I mean, once you see it yeah. and you do that, you know, how many times did I go to him, now Williams, and said, I failed here. Uh, and in reality, something failed and the product was not delivered on time as it had to be. It doesn't matter why. I can fix that later. But I take responsibility and my team started to realize that they they are safe. And that's the point. The leader is going to take the bullets for you. Uh, mm -hmm. But you, of course, that comes with trust and, and a lot of, of conversations. But when you feel safe, you produce your best work, isn't it? So yes, but, but also that's its own safe environment too. You. Because when you see somebody else take responsibility for your mistake, as leaders should, then you as as an employee start to take more responsibility into your own work. Yes, I, I, th there is there is a great uh, point here, and uh, our technical producer Brent just added it. A leader will pass the praise to the team and take responsibility for their errors. So he will absorb the responsibility and he will pass on the yeah. the the praise. So, okay, this worked well. It was the result of a teamwork. This did not work. I will do better next time in leading the team and getting there. That's And if you live like this, um, you will follow the example of Jesus. Because isn't that what Jesus did? Yeah. Okay, there is a big mess on earth. What did Jesus do? Did he blame? No, he said, I'm going to take full responsibility for the consequences of this. I will pay the price so you don't have to. And, and after that, I will call you. Uh, to be where I am. I refuse to let you pay for what you did. And that's forgiveness. That's that's um, that's what Jesus did. And it's so attractive. When we see leaders doing that, we surrender our leadership naturally. They don't need to force it. I do want to talk about something and I'm going to switch gears a little bit. And I know we're at, we're almost, we're, we're about to wrap up, but I do want to talk about this a little bit. And this is, you know, when I was going through and searching for um, information on this topic, like how researching good leadership. Um, unfortunately, most of what I saw was failed leadership. This person mm -hmm. stepped down, this person failed, this person failed. And um, two big examples of that happened this summer. Um, a couple weeks ago, one of the head pastors of Hillsong um, had to step back down for um, lack of integrity. A very well-known pastor, Jerry Falwell, who was president of 
um, I think it's Liberty University in Virginia, um, had to step down amongst a lot of accusations of lack of integrity. And I think what happens at this point, you know, we've talked about what makes a great leader and how we put trust and faith in a leader is advising people not to put too much faith and trust in a leader. Is that is that correct? Because here's the thing, all leaders are human, except for Jesus and except for God. We make mistakes, They we fall down. We don't always make the right choice. We don't always take the bullet for our colleagues. We don't always tell the truth. We don't always make the right choice. And my fear is sometimes when we put so much faith, you know, we talked earlier about when the general conference People came in the general conference, everybody was so excited. And we've seen that when we've traveled, the world stops, you know, the, they come and pick you up from the airport and they take you to the best hotel and they take you to a nice restaurant and, and they take you all around the city and, and you're, you're, (laughs) and it's so nice. And, but at the same time, when we fail, then does that cause a crisis in faith? Um, yeah. because we've put our leadership in the wrong place. I'm going to jump in on this. Uh, yes, please do. I think one of the challenges that we have, uh, and, you know, I'm going to speak in the Adventist community, but I think this is true of the broader Christian community, is that we have different levels of Christians. So, you know, instead of saying we're all Christians, we're all at the same level. We're like, okay, so the pastor is the next level of Christian up, and then you've got the conference president. They're the next level of Christian up. What and but what tends, what really is true, is that that person may have more influence or mm-hmm. more connections. But but you're absolutely right that uh, you know. Uh, I can remember when I was in high school, the, uh, the um, youth pastor had a, a more moral failure, and um, and it was devastating to yeah. us as, as a youth group. I mean, it was just devastating that our pastor, uh, you know, would do something like that. And and so I I think you know one of the things that that we do need to do as Christians is to realize that just because it's the pastor or the conference president or the general conference president uh, doesn't make them any less human uh, yeah. than than all the rest of us. We're all on this journey uh, of discipleship together. That that's absolutely brilliant. I I've got I'm going to approach it from a slightly different angle, if I may. I, there is a book called Leaders Eat Last by Simon Sinek. Fantastic book. Um, I, I tell everybody to read it because it is genuinely brilliant. Um, he tells the story of this guy who, who was serving in a position in the government. And he went to speak at a conference. And they picked him up at the airport with a limo. They brought him to the hotel. They carried his cases inside the hotel. When he arrived, there was somebody in the hotel waiting with the keys already to his room, and he went to his room. The next day, there was somebody ready with a drink in the morning uh, on, a, on a ceramic cup, and then he eventually f- went to the to the venue, and again, there was someone else to welcome him, take him to the different place, and by the time he got to the stage, again, a ceramic cup with a, with a beverage, and he got, gets up on stage, and he's talking. Okay. Next year, he goes back to the same event, but he's no longer filling that position in the government. Okay? So next year, there is no one to arrange the flights. There is no one to pick him up at the airport. There is no one at the hotel to wait for him. There is no ceramic cup anywhere. And he describes it as, I'm holding this paper cup on the stage that I got from the back. And he says something really profound. He says, I know that this is okay because... The ceramic cup was for my position, not for me. Mm. The ceramic cup was never for me. It was for my position. And that had a profound impact on me because some parts of the world, guys, you know this well. It's it's the, the level of deference and and it's deference is the right word. You know, it's it's like we appreciate your leadership and they go to a great extent to show how much they appreciate it. Well, guess what? It's not for you. It's for the position that you hold. Right. And in five years, when someone else is occupying that position, it would be for them. And you have to find your own way to the hotel from the airport. And that's okay because it was never for you in the first place. So th- that is that is very important for you to realize that your position and you are not the same. 
which means that if you're chosen to do something else later, uh, you should accept it gladly because that's God moving you somewhere else. It's right. not a, it's not a, it's not about you. On the other hand, let's talk about failures in this context. There are two parts here. Uh, first, you don't, you're not going to disappoint people if they realize that you're not perfect. They already know that. Everyone knows that. The problem comes that just like leaders conflate the position in them, so do members. So do those that are following. And so yes. if there is a moral failure by a pastor, a, a, say a youth pastor, the shock isn't that Mr. So-and-so or Mrs. So-and-so had the failure. Th th we already know that they're imperfect and all susceptible to this. The problem is, are all youth pastors like this? Can I trust people in that position of youth pastors? Mm -hmm. and, and that's the point. And so we really need amazing people in all of these positions to show that the position is honorable and the calling is very high and some people will fail and they will be replaced by others who will live, try to live up to a higher standard. Uh, and that's, if we understand that, then we can be graceful to the people that have failed without keeping them there. Because if you have a moral failure, uh, and it doesn't matter what it is, you need to go. That It's as simple as that. There are no, if there is a moral failure, then there's no point continuing to put you in that position of leadership or just moving you around to other places. Uh, you need to go through that process of restoring that faith over many years. But you need to be forgiven. And that often happens in the local church where grace can be found because people just came face to face with your moral failures. We all have them. So those are my thoughts about this, this uh, dichotomy of position and person and so on. It's really interesting because some of the most humble, um, and again, I'm going to talk within the Adventist faith tradition, but some of the most humble leaders that I've met think of themselves as stewards of the job, not so much as embodiment of that position. You know, we have our terms as when you reach a certain um, level of leadership, your term lasts about five years. Um, and I'm a steward of this job for five years. After that, I no longer have this job. I think GT, Ng, who is the executive secretary of the Adventist Church, says it's a lot. After that, I no longer have this job unless they choose to put me in it again for yeah, the next yeah. five years as a steward. And that's why the corridors of the General Conference have pictures from the 1800s of every leader that occupied that position. So that every day you are reminded that it's not about you. You're just a steward of that leadership position that is supposed to further the objectives of that ministry. Uh, but you're here today <laughs> and you will be gone tomorrow. Yeah, the other the other story that I will, and then I want to um, sort of wrap up, but the other story I will leave with is that... Um, Clifford Goldstein, who is the editor of the Sabbath School Guide. Except he for said, Clifford, he's never gone. Cliff has yeah, been he's never gone. 30 something years. <laughs> well, what he says is he, he said that um, he, there was a there was a leader in the church, a big, a big name, and um, a young kid came to work. And the the leader had retired and he had moved on. And he said, Hey, do you reckon do you remember this guy? He used to be a leader here. And and the guy said, I think I remember I've heard of his name. Um, I don't remember it, you know, and that cut Cliff to the core because, you know, that we are so easily forgotten in our roles that we only have this amount of time was quite the humbling experience for him. Um, so yeah, to remember that we're stories of our job and that, that life moves on, but that hopefully that we have led well enough to create some form of legacy behind us that continues that vision of leadership. There is this story about this famous singer, very famous singer, who went on this elderly uh, home, nursing home. And they were talking to this elderly lady and, and were singing and so on. So he, they came to this elderly lady and asked, um, hey, do you, do you know who I am? And the elderly lady looked at him and said, no, love. But if you ask in reception, I'm sure they'll help you. <laughs> <laughs> so sometimes it's easy for us to, to have this idea that, uh, we are well known and respected across the world. The reality is no one really knows us. Um, and there are very few people that everyone knows. So mm -hmm. having that humility to know that it's not about you is key, I think, to leadership, both in a secular environment and in the religious Christian environment. Right. 
Well, we're getting ready to wrap up. We've been talking for a long time and I know there's a lot more that we could say, but what I would love to ask is if each of you would have one more thing to say about this issue, if you would love to advise maybe a young leader. Um, so Sam, we'll start with you and then Brad will go to you. And if Brad, at the end of what of your takeaway from this, if you could pray for us, that would be great. I, I would say it's a very simple thing. If you want to be a great leader, then you must become a great follower. Jesus chose the disciples because they were teachable. So be teachable. Every day you need to learn something that you did not know. And if you're looking for opportunities to learn, God will give you plenty of opportunities to learn. And learn them and then serve uh, without the idea of taking, but instead with the idea of giving. So be be teachable as much as you can. Allow yourself to be taught and help others to achieve their ministry and their goals as fast as possible. And people will follow you because you're a great follower yourself and you can lead them somewhere. Yeah. So I, I'm going to uh, put something in that should be maybe part of another show. And that yeah. is, I think that leaders um, today need to intentionally work on developing cultural competencies in, in, in this world and leadership, you know, we, we are increasingly called to lead people who grew up in a completely different cultural context than what we uh, did. And we need to be leaders for everyone, uh, not just for people who look like or think like or have our history. Um, and I think that that's a huge, huge challenge for, for leaders. So Jennifer, maybe another time. Yeah, no, you just have given us, look, Cultural that leader. was a great idea. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to be writing that down because that's an important one, especially if you think within the Adventist church, um, we, we call people from all over the world. And even within each of our divisions, um, there's people working from different contexts. So thank you so much. Brad, okay. if you could pray for us. Well, let's bow our heads. Yeah. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for the great opportunity to talk about uh, leadership. And Jesus, you were such an amazing model for us. And to just ask a bit, uh, you be with each one of us uh, and those that are uh, watching to be able to say, so what would Jesus do? How would Jesus lead? How would he have supported each one of the people uh, that are following us that we're called to lead? And Lord, I just ask that you help us to make a difference, not only in our, our churches, but also in the communities that are surrounding us. I ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So thank you all for joining us for this week's episode of ANN in depth. I hope that you are have learned something. I hope that you go out and you make yourself open to either be a mentor or to find a mentor that you, you know, exercise some of the principles that you learn in Christian leadership. We will be back next week with another episode. Have a great week. See you, Jennifer. <laughs>